So economics is one of those things that is always, it's baffling to a lot of people. Yes. And um, in your book you, you talk about economics and, and where, it, where it comes from, what it means. And I think it's really helpful to break these words down. They, they take on a life of their own, but it's really helpful to go back to the roots of what it originally meant. So economics comes from two Greek words that have been squished together, mm -hmm. ekos and nomos. Ekos means the household. Yep. And nomos means the art of management or the norms. So economics means the art of household management. And you can take that from the level of an individual estate. In fact, the first author, Xenophon, wrote this pamphlet in ancient Greece about the economist. And it was the art of the household management. How do you manage your estate? How do you manage your slaves? And do you allow your wife to run the accounts? And how do you manage your grain reserves and your wine and your cloth? Later in his life, Xenophon took it to the level of the city-state. Mm -hmm. It was Adam Smith who took it to the level of the nation-state. Mm -hmm. Thousands of years later, why does one nation as a household thrive while others are staggered? Mm -hmm. And now it's our turn to take it from this nation-state to the planetary household. So we can think of economics at all these different scales. But if you just step back and think, economics means the art of household management. They couldn't being more nobler quest than to ask how do we manage our planetary household in the interest of all its inhabitants. And if that's what economics means, bring it on, let's do it. But it's not what it's meant in the past. Well, what's quite nice about that um, verbal metaphor is that it domesticates a global problem. Yeah, as long as we don't overextend that metaphor, Margaret Thatcher famously overextend that metaphor so well, you know, households should live in their means therefore nations should live in their means well there's real differences individual households don't have a national bank that they can go to and create money when they need it whereas a nation does and so there's as we all know there's real dangers to overextending a metaphor our household the global household yeah. at the moment yeah. what isn't working in the sort of 21st century it's not going well let's just think about how the 21st century began with repeated crises, and we've had financial meltdown in 2008, massive hit on millions of people's livelihoods, their homes. We've had, we live in an era of climate and ecological breakdown, and that's the overriding crisis of our times. That's given rise to protest and actually a rising um, crackdown on protesters. And then we just had two years of COVID lockdown. And these crises, may emerge from different sources and they're reported really differently in the news, but they all show us that our lives are profoundly interconnected with each other and the rest of the living world, that they hit with really sharp inequalities of gender and of race, of wealth and power of, between the global north and the global south. But they all arise from systems that are based upon endless expansion. So if you have a financial system that aims to endlessly expand, it will kick off a subprime mortgage market and, a, and the bubble will burst. If you have humanity endlessly expanding our use of fossil fuels and as resources, we will induce climate and ecological breakdown. If we're endlessly expanding human settlements into areas of wildlife, coupled with increasing global travel by flight, we, we create perfect conditions for zoonotic disease transfer and, and a global health pandemic. So these systems of endless expansion are driving crisis and we see that showing up in the billions of people worldwide still cannot meet their most essential needs and at the same time as that enduring human deprivation we are running down the life support systems of our planetary home that management of the household we are destroying the stability of the climate we are breaking down the web of life acidifying the oceans drying up lakes and rivers, the very living systems on which all of us depend. You talked about Global North, Global mm. South, you know, a lot of us um, don't feel that in our modern, you know, we can walk out in the streets and go and buy stuff in supermarkets and whatnot. Yeah, and the Global North is so powerfully provisioned by the rest of the world. As you say, we often don't feel it. There's food on the shelves in the supermarkets, there's water in the taps. Uh, we lead lives of comfort sometimes. I feel like we live in, in the, you know, in um, the Hunger Games. It's like we, the global north is the capital of the Hunger Games, um, provisioned by everybody else to their 
detriment to their leaving then in deprivation because global trade rules, global financing and powers have structured the global economy so that so many of the world's resources are driven into the hands of those in the global north. And that means we are often really sensitive to the extremes of deprivation that people elsewhere live every day. I mean, the, the crash was a perfect time to actually say, shouldn't we rebuild now based on that system not working? Although sometimes in the midst of a crisis, you have to rescue something or save because individuals' lives and families and households and jobs are so at risk. So there's always that moment, is, is it possible to completely rebuild in a crisis, but well, let's, let's, let's protect what we need to protect now and then coming out of it, let's rebuild. But instead of coming out of it, rebuilding, it almost like just restored what was yeah, there. Yeah, and that reminds me of um, the Great Fire of London when it burnt down. Had the opportunity, I think, Christopher Wren, Sir Christopher Wren, he, he designed London like like Paris. It got constructed back on the exact same mm -hmm. markings as before, instead of being clear, like, hey, we can build a new city but these that moments, won't burn down. Right, but moments of crisis, um, as Naomi Klein brilliantly wrote about in her book, The Shock Doctrine, crisis is an opportunity for new ideas to come in, but which new ideas will come in? Crises can be an opportunity for renewal and reinventing, but they can also be an opportunity for entrenching, entrenching existing yes. power. And so that's the importance of having powerful ideas that are lying around that actually are ready to be brought in to transform in a positive way the systems that we've inherited rather than entrenching the old. Not that many people feel confident with economic equations and there's a real danger that because economics gets performed so much in maths, that many of you say, oh, that's too complex for me, that's too hard for me, I can't do that, I'm not a mathematician. But everybody should be able to manage their own household, right? So if we reframe the, the verb of framing of, of economics as going back to the core of the, the source, which is household management. Yeah, we're all part of this planetary household. We are so interconnected with the lives on the other side of the planet. And even though it's painful to realize the way we are living here, the way we are, the way we travel and heat our homes and consume and buy things and throw things away, that is having impacts on people worldwide. And that's painful. It's much easier to turn away from and ignore. But if we look at the planetary scale, we, we, we can't ignore it. We have to see it.